everybody um, I appreciate the opportunity to come and share with you all. Um, today I'm going to talk about the family of God. Um, the first passage I'd like to go to is 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2. Um, I meant to have handouts with all the verses on it, but I had computer trouble, so I don't have any handouts. Um, so I'll try to give you guys enough time to get to things. Um, 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, and the younger as sisters with all purity. I personally find so many of the word pictures of how we are to treat and interact with each other as believers to be quite beautiful, whether it's the one body with many members, each having need for each other, or whether it is this exhortation to treat each other as family in Christ. I think to truly understand this, we need to be good Bereans and search the Scriptures so we can see more of what these words might practically mean. However, I also want to say a thing or two, say that one thing is sure, that we cannot use the phrase with all purity as an excuse as some have to avoid interacting with each other. We cannot interact with anybody that we avoid. Um, sorry, we cannot entreat anybody that we avoid, so we'd be automatically be violating the direction of this passage. Purity is vitally important, and all our interactions within the body of Christ should be governed by it. But we cannot use it as an excuse to not fulfill our other duties, such as bearing one another's burdens, caring for the saints, providing for widows, exhorting, rebuking, teaching, praying for the saints, forgiving one another, and so many more. So we must ask ourselves, how are we supposed to treat each other, and what does a godly family look like, and how does that apply to the body of Christ, and the local assembly in particular? Before I get into some specifics of how I think it might apply to these particular roles, there is a couple general principles I would like to cover first. Um, Philippians 2, 1 and 8. Sorry, Philippians 2, 1 through 8. Um, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, fulfill ye my joy, and be ye like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in loneliness of mind let each esteem others as better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The if that Paul gives here has already been established as true earlier on in the epistle. Since the first is true, then we should be doing the things which follow. I think the item that is most confused in this passage is to be like-minded. It is so often used to say that we cannot disagree, or we at least have to agree to disagree and not to discuss it again. However, the like mind that we're supposed to have is the mind of Christ, which in this context is a humble mind that sacrifices and gives of oneself for the good of others. I know this isn't an easy thing to do, 
But if we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds and to be conformed to the image of the Son, then this is the mind that we need to seek to have. This mind is not even possible for the unbeliever. But we have been given the mind of Christ and are the temple of God with Christ in us. Esteeming others as better than ourselves is not about demeaning ourselves or trashing who we are. It is about lifting others up to where they should be in Christ. It isn't about seeing how awful and how unacceptable we can make ourselves appear, but seeking to help others see who they are in Christ as accepted and chosen vessels for His glory. It is about putting the needs of the body of Christ ahead of our own personal desires It is about making sure that God gets the glory. Um, Galatians 6, verse 2 says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. I'm just going to touch on this briefly, but we cannot bear the burden of another if we don't know they have a burden. And we're not likely to know they have a burden unless we have gotten to know them. We must invest ourselves in truth and love towards someone before they are apt to open up and share their burden with us. Once again, this takes time. This may take opening up in honesty. It may take money to prepare meals to feed them. It may take vulnerability on our part to share our own burden first. But if we need to bear one another's burdens to fulfill the law of Christ, then we should not only be willing to invest of ourselves in this, then we should be willing to invest ourselves in this way because Christ invested even more of Himself for us. Um, going back to my first passage, 1 Timothy 5.1, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. This passage says we are not to rebuke, but to entreat. Specifically, this has to do with the way in which a pastor would correct an elder man in his assembly. But I think generally it applies also at a deeper level. I do not think we need to be... I do think (laughs) we need to be especially respectful and careful if we take it upon ourselves to correct someone who is older or more mature in the faith than we are. However, it does say as a father... So, the question should be, how should we treat a father? Ephesians 6, 2 says, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. But what does it mean to honor one's father? I think several things are involved. One is esteem. We should all esteem our fathers. I think it also includes a testimony of esteem. In other words, we do not keep our esteem of them to ourselves, and it includes treating them with dignity. I know some of us have had earthly fathers where it might be more difficult to have a testimony of esteem for them, but hopefully we in the body of Christ could have a testimony of esteem for them. Hopefully we could tell them and tell others something we appreciate or respect about them. I should say here that I do not think it is honoring them to say something that is not true or that we do not mean. I think part of honoring our fathers, both the ones in the flesh and the ones within the family of God, is to be able to be gracious while acknowledging their faults, but love and respect them anyway. I think sometimes one of the most difficult times to honor a father is when we think they are wrong. But to love, respect, and seek to understand them in these times, I believe, is a way of honoring them. But I do not think honor stops here. In Matthew 5, 15 and 16, we read, But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the command of God of none effect by your tradition. I think a large part of honoring one's earthly father or mother is providing for their needs. 
Paul says that, the first, that this is the first commandment with promise. I think this sets this commandment apart as special. Paul also says, but if any provide not for his own, especially for them of his own house, he is denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. I believe even in grace, one very important aspect of honoring our fathers is to provide for them. Now, I think our responsibility is first to our own father, but I do not think it ends there. I think we are also responsible to provide for the older men in the body of Christ. This may not mean giving money, but it does mean giving. There are many men in nursing homes that a short visit, even every other week, would mean a lot to them. There are men who would feel very honored if once a month someone took them out to eat and had a conversation with them. When Paul speaks of the care of widows in 1 Timothy 5.16, he makes this statement, If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. From this, I think we could gather that while we should first care for those <coughs> of, of our own family, there should be a joint effort by the local assembly to provide for the needs of those within the body who do not have a family who can or will. So while it is speaking of widows, I think one way we honor our fathers in the body of Christ is to be part of any efforts in our church to meet the needs of older men and women in the body. Philippians 2.22 says, speaking of Timothy, but you know the proof of him, that as a son with the Father, he has served with me in the gospel. I think another aspect of treating elder men within the body of Christ as fathers is to serve alongside them. In the case of the Apostle Paul and some men, this is within the specific context of the gospel. And while all of us should minister in that way, not every man serves primarily in this way. We honor men as fathers when we serve alongside them in the work that they do, whether in the ministry or in some other area. Anytime you help a man older than you fulfill his tasks while learning from him, you are honoring him as a father. Train up children. Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up children in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Ephesians 6.4 says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. While these verses are more directed to what a father should be and do, I think we can learn something about how we should treat them in turn, and in turn learn how to treat older men in the church. Our fathers and the older men in church have something special to teach us, most often many things. And we treat them as fathers if we give them the time and respect so that they can teach us. Proverbs 13.1 says, A wise son hears his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. I think part of treating the elder men as fathers is listening to their advice, counsel, and instruction. I'm not talking about blindly following them, because we should still be good Bereans and search the scriptures to see whether the things that they're telling us are true. But even if we do not fully understand them, or even if necessarily like their instruction, advice, or counsel, we should be careful to heed it if there is nothing in Scripture to oppose it. Leviticus 19.32 says, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man, and fear thy God, I am the Lord. There was a time when people would show honor to the elderly by standing up when they entered a room or approached. While we may not need to follow this exact outward formality, we need to make sure that we show respect to and <clears throat> acknowledge the elder men as fathers who have wisdom and something to offer us. We need to honor them as men who are worthy and esteem them as better than ourselves. We are also instructed to treat the older women as mothers. Much of what I just shared about fathers 
would apply to them as well. It isn't only fathers we are told to honor. It is mothers as well. It isn't just fathers who train up children. It is mothers as well. Proverbs 31, 28 says, Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. There are so many women in the body of Christ who have excelled in being virtuous. Yet how often do we recognize that about them? How often do we bless or appreciate the older women in church who pray for us as a body, who prepare food, who raise up children, who help their husbands by making a place of hospitality so that He can serve others? These women should definitely be praised. However, what about women who have not excelled in this way? I think that we should still seek to edify and encourage them and seek to be grateful for them. If for no other reason than the position that they have in the body of Christ as an older woman. Paul's command to treat the older woman as a mother doesn't come with a qualification if they are motherly or if they are excellent, but without qualification, we are to treat them as mothers. 2 Timothy 1 verse 5 says, When I call to remembrance the unfaith faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. I think this passage and others indicate that much of Timothy's initial faith and knowledge of the things of Scripture came to him from his mother. I think one way we can treat the elder women as mothers is seeking to learn what they can teach us about faith and godliness. I'm not suggesting that women are permitted to be preachers. But many have lessons of faith and godliness, and we've missed out on all that because we have never stopped to ask an older woman within the church what she thought Scripture taught on some subject. Titus 2, 3 through 5 has some specific examples of some of the ways women can teach younger women, the aged women likewise, that they be in good behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wines, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. While both men and women can treat the elder women <clears throat> as mothers by learning from them, I hope this verse encourages every young lady to seek out an older lady in the church to learn from. I think first and foremost, it should be her own mother, if she has a godly mother. But I think it will do her and the elder women much good if she seeks to learn these things from them. Might I say that young men could benefit from these things as well? Young men going into marriage might have a better understanding and appreciation of what a godly wife is if they had some idea of what she went through and learned to become one. I think mothers not only play a key role in helping girls become women, but they also have a role in helping boys become men. And I encourage all of us to seek what we could learn from the elder women in our lives. I think we can learn from an event in Jesus' crucifixion of how important it is for our mothers, for caring for our mothers, can be. In John 19, 25 through 27, we read, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, Behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took unto his own home, took her into his own home. If Jesus was so concerned for his mother in this hour of his life, facing all that he was facing and going through all that he was going through, how can we say things like, I just don't have the time. I think it is okay to say, I don't know how. But we can learn. 
And after scripture, I think the best way to learn is to get to know an older woman in our church and ask her how we can make her feel honored as a mother. Proverbs 1, verse 8 says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Proverbs 15, 20 says, A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish man despises his mother. I think these and other passages further indicate how important it is for us to listen to and unless Scripture indicates otherwise to do our best to heed our fathers and mothers. If we cannot take the time to learn from and benefit from the older men and women in church, then we are being foolish and are despising not only the lessons they have for us, but we are also despising them as fathers and mothers. There is one final verse I want to share concerning how I think we should treat the elder men and elder women as fathers and mothers that I think indirectly applies. Hebrews 13.17 says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is an unprofitable for you. Like I said, this is only indirectly in the context this isn't talking about fathers and mothers. But fathers and mothers do bear rule over us. And the elder men and women in the church, they're not out to be obnoxious or mean. And we could benefit a lot if we would just submit to what they have to teach us. Proverbs 17.17 17 says, A friend loveth at all times and a brother is born for adversity. Brothers are there for us in the hard times. So part of treating the younger men as brothers is being there for them in hard times. Yet so many of us are not and cannot be because we were not there before the hard time came. It is unlikely that a brother in Christ is going to come to you in the midst of a trial unless you have first established that you are faithful and that you care. Again, I think we have to give of ourselves, invest ourselves in others, so that when hard times come upon them, they know we can be trusted, and so that they are willing to allow us to bear their burden with them. However, this verse, I think, can also have us know that it is okay to let our brothers know when we are in adversity. How can I truly call a man my brother if I never let him know or help in my hard times. If I prevent him from bearing my burden with me, <coughs> sorry. If I prevent him from bearing my burden with me, can I truly call him a brother? It can be very humbling to admit that we are struggling. It can be painful to admit that we need help. But if we try to prevent, pretend that we do not need a brother in Christ in our difficulties, do I not do not honestly think we can say we esteem them as better than ourselves. I think every man should be prepared to go to a brother in Christ when he is in difficulty and openly share the struggle. And I think every man should be prepared to listen and to do what he can, even if it is just to edify and pray when a brother in Christ comes to him with a difficulty. Leviticus 19, verse 17 says, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise, thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and shalt not suffer sin upon him. I think Paul echoes a similar sentiment in Galatians 6, 1. Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault... Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Most of us would probably <clears throat> never admit or even think that we hate our brother or neighbor. But if we see our brother or sister in sin and do not address it by speaking the truth in love, we are hating our brother. Now we must do so in a spirit of meekness. Because let's face it, all of us could fall into sin. 
all of us could fall into the sin that we see them in. We could be tempted, and but for God's grace, we would fall. As a quick side note, I think all of us need to keep 1 Timothy, 1 Corinthians 10.13 in our mind. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful and will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation provide a way to escape that you might be able to bear it. Romans 14.21 says, it is, good to, to, it is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything by where my brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Now this verse applies to every member of the body of Christ, but it is worth considering here. There are many things that we might enjoy that are not necessarily wrong. But if we were to treat the younger men as brothers, we might need to forego. We might need to sacrifice something we enjoy to help make a brother in Christ stronger. I think that similarly to the way we labor with fathers, we should labor with brothers. Philippians 2.25 says, Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, and companion in labor, and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he that ministereth to my wants. I think that we need to be ready to not only help our brothers in areas of ministry, but in any area of life. This may be as simple as having him over for lunch, or helping him with his car, or helping him find an answer in Scripture. Zechariah 7, verses 9 and 10 says, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment, and shew mercy and compassion every man to his brother, and oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. While this command was directed specifically to Israel, considering that we are not to go to law before unbelievers, that we are to be kind to one another, prefer one another, and be compassionate. I think that the principle of this verse applies as well. Proverbs 18, verse 13 says, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. I am not... How many of us judge before we know? We should not do this. I'm not saying we turn a blind eye to wrongdoing, but we need to hear both sides. We also need to be very careful about judging the thoughts and intents. I've been in more than one situation where someone was getting very bent out of shape over something that was said when what was said was actually relatively minor, but they assumed some malicious intent behind it. I've seen someone get upset because someone did not wave and they assumed it was because the person was being spiteful. I'm not immune to this tendency either. We all tend to, we all need to execute true judgment. And we cannot do that if we make assumptions about another person's heart. I believe that the children of God, we ought ought to be characterized by mercy and compassion. And we need to be sure we show mercy and compassion to our brothers in Christ. They may inadvertently, or even deliberately, hurt us at times. And we need to respond in mercy and compassion. We need to show compassion to our brothers who are hurting. All too often in our culture, we want to tell men who are hurting to man up and move on. But this is not showing compassion. And what our hurting brother needs is compassion. Lastly, We are to treat the younger women as sisters with all purity. Now, as I said earlier, we cannot use purity as an excuse to not treat the younger women as sisters. We cannot use purity as an excuse to not develop a connection with and not interact with them and not support them. And not we cannot use an excuse to not seek to understand them, and we cannot use it as an excuse to not be their friend. 
So the question is, how do we treat the younger women as sisters with all purity? I think the first thing we need to remember is Jesus' words to the Pharisees, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. If we, are tr- tru- if we are having trouble treating our sisters in Christ with purity, then there must be a heart issue. There must be sin in our hearts. Besides the fact that God's sacrifice for us ought to be enough to motivate us and drive us to treat them with purity, there is also the fact that Christ died for them as well. I think we can learn from some of the ways we are to treat sisters in Christ by examining some of the passages on how husbands are to treat wives. Now, some of these passages cannot be applied, but I believe the following can be. 1 Peter 3, verse 7 says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. I think we need to interact with our sisters in Christ according to knowledge. Now some may wonder what that might mean. I think the simplest meaning is that we are to interact with them in a way of understanding. Romans 10, 1 through 3 says, Brethren, my heart's desire to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. You see, in this case, the Jews knew about God. They were even zealous about the way they perceived and believed Him to be. But they had not learned who He really was and what He really desired. So they approached him on their terms and failed. I think all too often men fail to properly interact with women because they do a quick study of women, both generally and individually, and never take the time to learn how a woman should and would want to be approached and interacted with. Giving honor unto the wife as a weak, weaker vessel. As I've, mentioned a few, um, as I've mentioned, we are to honor and prefer one another. And I think this is especially true of our sisters in Christ. Honor carried with it several ideas, such as esteeming, exalting, preferring, and deferring. Paul speaks about edifying, which basically means to build up and strengthen. How much honor do we really do for our sisters in Christ? How often do we as people, and men in particular, go out of our way to encourage a sister in Christ? How often are we willing to remind her that she has value? I'm not suggesting that we always give a woman whatever she wants. But how often do we make plans without considering her plans or wants? Unless a woman wants something wrong, I think we should, could show a lot of honor by just deferring to her often. Now, this may take, <clears throat> now some take offense at the phrase, weaker vessel. But it doesn't say she is weak. It says, as the weaker vessel. This means to treat her with gentleness, which, by the way, is part of the fruit of the Spirit anyway. Lastly, this verse talks about treating them as heirs together of the grace of life. We as men need to be particularly careful that we do not start thinking that as men we have some kind of inside track on God We need to recognize that God's grace extends to women as well, and as such, women are valuable and have a purpose. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, as a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. I think as we approach our sisters in Christ, it should be in a sacrificial way. We shouldn't be seeking what we can get out of it, but their perfection in Christ. I am not 
talking about going around and correcting every little flaw or beating them over the head with Scripture. The imagery here again is one of sacrifice and gentleness. We should always be gently, patiently, and lovingly seeking their good and their growth. In Genesis 34, we have an account where Hamor lies lies with and defiles Jacob's daughter. And in judgment, two of her brothers slay him and the inhabitants of that city. Some say that they were wrong in doing so. However, I do not think Scripture is clear on this. It is clear that Jacob rebukes them and complains that they put him at risk of being destroyed, which given God's promises to Jacob was not even a possible event. But they respond, should he deal with our sister as with a harlot? And there is no record that there is further discussion. It is as if this is the winning argument. Um, This, along with the consequences given in the law of a man lying with a maid, given throughout the law, indicates how seriously we men ought to take this sort of thing. Not only in how we treat women, but in how we respond to how other men treat women. I'm not saying we should slay every man in a city if one man offends against a sister in Christ in this way. But we should not take such things lightly, We should not stand idly by if we even hear any man speaking impurely of a sister in Christ. 1 Peter 3, 8 says, Finally, be ye of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. This doesn't apply exclusively to how we should treat sisters in Christ but it does apply to how we should treat them. We should have compassion. Compassion carries with it the idea of suffering with another, or as a combination of both love and sorrow. To have compassion means to weep with those that weep. It means to love them so much that their troubles become our own. It means to acquaint ourselves with their grief. I think the best way to love as brethren is seen in 1 Corinthians 13, and I encourage all of us to measure our love for everyone in the body of Christ by that standard. Being pitiful carries with it a similar idea of compassion. It also carries with it the idea of being sensitive and tender-hearted. Being courteous refers to having good manners towards others and treating others well. Sadly, I think Too often in Christian circles, we discourage genuine and close connections among brothers and sisters in Christ. And while I am fully convinced it has always been with good intentions, I think it is unwise and it is damaging to the body of Christ. I think that many of the reasons husbands and wives have so much trouble understanding each other is because they did not interact with each other and with others as brothers and sisters in Christ, but instead only interacted with the opposite gender prior to marriage as dates. I can't remember where I heard this, but the problem with marrying based on dating alone is dating only tells you how you might do vacation together. The other issue with only interacting positively with each other if there's a romantic relationship or the potential for one is that we are essentially devaluing the other person by saying, you are only worth good from me if I think I'm getting something out of it. Mm-hmm. Brethren, our sisters in Christ are worth our best. They are worth our kindness, gentleness, patience, love, honor, respect, and time, even if we receive nothing from them in return. There are those who discourage male and female friendships on the basis that the friendships will have to change if either of them marry. And I have a lot of respect for those who I've heard say this. However, I think our friendships with the same gender will also have to change after marriage. And if we are truly treating our sisters in Christ as sisters in Christ, then the changes will not be harmful. Also, I think as two people are moving towards 
marriage and becoming one flesh, I think there needs to be a combining of friends so the woman's brothers in Christ become her husband's brothers and a man's sisters in Christ becomes his wife's sisters as well. As a quick side note, I think all too often married people make the mistake of turning their back on their single friends after marriage. I think single and married people are part of the same body and they need to keep this in mind. However, while I think men and women can be and even should be friends, that we need to be careful that we're honest with each other. While Jesus was speaking of oaths when he said, let your yes be yes and your no mean no, I think there's a principle we can draw from it. We should mean what we say and be honest in our communications. I think that we need to be honest with each other in our interactions. I think this means that with the yeses of wanting a relationship and with the noes of not wanting a relationship. I think this is one area where we need to be honest with each other as much as we think it might be better to hide our feelings on either side of this. In the end, we hurt each other more. I'm not saying that people will not get hurt in these kind of situations. But I think we need to remember Proverbs 27, 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. It is better to give a little hurt as a friend in love than to make oneself an actual enemy by being dishonest so as to avoid personal responsibility. One final thought before I close. At the beginning, I mentioned the one body. Paul was speaking of spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 when he said, For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it has pleased Him. And they were, <clears throat> and they were, and if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor the hand to the feet. I have no need of ye, you. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. While this is speaking of spiritual good gifts in the context, I think we can learn from this. Just because someone is older or younger than us does not mean they're not part of the body. And just because someone is the opposite gender doesn't mean we do not need them. In fact, I would say that we definitely need each other. Old, and young, men and women, part of being part of the one body and part of the family as God is recognizing that we need each other, we need them, and they need us. I think in the church today, there are many in the body who are living amputated, or at least have a tourniquet between them and other parts of the body. It is my hope and prayer that all of us seek to be deliberate in connecting with each other as part of the body of Christ and not our own little groups that we're most comfortable interacting with.